All right. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I know folks are going to keep on joining as we go through. Uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction here, but um, I'm just so excited about today's webinar. Uh, Peter Shankman, someone I'm going to introduce in just a second. He's someone I've followed and admired for many, many years. So um, borderline stockish. So I'm going to pretend not to know that much about him. I'm going to ask questions, some of which I know the answers to, just because I have been following him online and and his exploits since probably about 2009. Um, so I, I know quite a bit of Peter to the point of creepiness, but again, I'm gonna to try to play it cool today. So if you're in the world of marketing, PR, social media, you probably know Peter, um, but the beauty of his background is it really doesn't matter where, you know, what your industry is, what function you're in. He is so creative and innovative that, that I, I, I wanted to present him and his background and his story to folks from various walks of life because I know there's something that everybody can gain from what he's accomplished in his career. But if you don't know him, I'm gonna take just a minute to uh, talk through a little bit of his background. He's probably best known to many folks as the founder of Harrow, Help a Reporter Out. It's a service that connects journalists with sources. It was later acquired by Vocus, which is now uh, Cision. And I actually was an, an advertiser on Harrow or in the early days and it worked really well. So. He's a keynote speaker. If you follow Peter on the social networks, in non-COVID times, he's all over the world, hopping on planes, giving talks, consulting with companies, organizations all over the world. He runs Shank Minds, a breakthrough network, an elite online mastermind of thought leaders, business experts, and change makers. He's the host of Faster Than Normal. It's the number one podcast on the internet for ADHD, and it focuses on the superpowers and gifts of having a faster than normal brain. He's also written a book by the same name, Faster Than Normal, which I've read and is a, is a great read. I don't know whether I have ADHD or not, but I definitely got a lot out of it. Uh, maybe I do, maybe I don't, I've never, I've never found out. Uh, some of his customer service and social media clients have included American Express, Sprint, SAP, US Department of Defense, Walt Disney, NASA, Saudi Aramco, Sheraton, and the list goes on. He's a five-time best-selling author. I mentioned one of his books. And he's an influencer and spokesperson for Brands including Specialized Bikes, Scratch Labs, uh, Thule, Scotty Vest, and many others. And lastly, he's a dad, a, a dad of two-time Ironman triathlete. Peter and I were just speaking. He's training for another triathlon right now. He's a Class B licensed skydiver. He's got a Peloton addiction. And he, he's got a, a daughter and a 21-year-old and a cat, I believe, and a dog. So with that, welcome, Peter. Really excited <laughs> to have you. Thanks, man. Good to be here. Awesome. Well, let's get started. There's so much we could talk about and, you know, your story is amazing, but I, I know there are folks on this, on this webinar right now who maybe they're in a job they don't like, or maybe they're a job they love, but they probably got the entrepreneurship bug or thinking about it. And, and I know, you know, you went through that. It's been 20 plus years since you kind of made that, made that decision to go into entrepreneurship. So let's start there. You, you graduated from Boston university Take us through your first couple of, of corporate jobs and how you ended up landing into entrepreneurship and making that transition. So my first job out of school, um, I was in grad school and I had 18 credits to go in fashion and portrait photography in California. And uh, it was awesome. I was, you know, spending every day on the beach photographing people. It was, it was great. Uh, with 18 credits to go, I lost my financial aid. The government sent me a letter that said, uh, we're taking away your financial aid. Your parents make too much money. And I sent the government a letter back, said, dear government, my parents do make too much money. However, they, they keep it. And uh, the government didn't find that funny. <laughs> so I moved back to New York City, uh, back to my parents' uh, basement. They had a house in Staten Island at the time. And um, I was hanging out in, in a chat room in America Online. This is back in the 90s, back when AOL was the internet. And um, someone said, hey, uh, my company's trying to build a newsroom. You have a journalism degree from Boston University. Why don't you, uh, why don't you submit your resume? And I went, sure, yeah, I have, I have no experience. Um, I'm fresh out of school. This would be awesome, I'm, I'm, I'd love to. And uh, I sent him a resume and I learned that sarcasm doesn't translate well over the internet. <laughs> and I was hired two weeks later as one of the founding editors of America Online. And uh, I launched my career, um, yeah, by building an online newsroom with, uh, Two other people, and we had no idea what we were doing. Literally, no idea what we were doing. And we went in, and we um, we started it 
with the premise that we'll do something and if it works and our members stick around, we'll do more of that. If it doesn't work, we'll do something else. And that's probably one of the best lessons I ever learned. Um, you know, keep throwing shit against the wall. Uh, eventually, when, you're, when you love what you do, you'll keep finding ways to do it better. And eventually your audience will uh, come to like it or you'll stumble upon something that they like. And uh, that's the thing you want to do. So you, so you were there, you, so you're at America Online. At AOL for about uh, just in three years. Mm -hmm. uh, came in one day, they had a giant uh, layoff. Bob Pittman killed 85% of their content team. Um, I was one of them. Went home. Uh, so like at 8 a.m. we all had jobs. At 10, 30 a.m. we're on the parking lot going, what the fuck was that? Um, had no idea what just happened. So we went back to, uh, went back to my apartment, moved, packed it up, moved back to New York City, and found that half the world wanted to hire me because I, uh, I worked today well. And, and this was the start of the dot-com boom. And AOL was the internet. Everyone wanted it. So mm -hmm. downside, though, was that uh, AOL was, was special in that, in that they didn't give a damn how you did your job as long as you got it done, right? So mm -hmm. you wanted to work at, you know, 3 in the morning or work from midnight to 8 or whatever. Just get the work done. And they were cool with that. And so then I, I come back to New York. I have all these, all these job opportunities. One of them is uh, for a magazine, an associate editor of a financial magazine. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. And I, I, I take it. And uh, I remember like first two weeks, you know, I have to be in Bay 30 and we have an editorial meeting at nine and lunch is from 12 to one and another meeting in the afternoon. And, and I'm sitting there, I'm two weeks in, I'm like, this is, this, this, this is Russia and this is not okay. And I quit. Um, and by this time I was, I guess, 98. I called my parents. I was living in a studio apartment, like roughly the size of like that sign behind you. And uh, <laughs> I called my parents and said, I'm quitting my job and I'm gonna start my own PR firm. What do you know about starting a PR firm? Absolutely nothing. But I worked, you know, part of my job at AOL was to teach people how to use the internet and why it was so important and, you know, how to tell senators how, why the internet was important. And, I feel like I could do it. And, and when it fails, I'll just get a, a, another job. I literally said, when it fails, I'll get another job. Not if it fails, when it fails. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that was uh, May, I think, of 98. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that now? Almost 23 years. Right. I haven't had to get another job. Um, I've gotten really lucky. I mean, I've, I've, I've had incredible highs and I've had incredible lows. And that's kind of the beauty of being an entrepreneur is that, you know, there's no, everyone thinks of an entrepreneurship sort of like that. And entrepreneurship is really sort of this way and that way and then around the bend and this way and then, and then, you know, and if you wind up somewhere you want to be and it turns out it's not where you want to be at all, but somehow you get there. Yeah. And um, that's pretty much what I've done. And it's, it's been an amazing ride and, and I've had tremendous highs, tremendous lows, um, but I wouldn't change it. For, I, I wouldn't change anything. It's, it's been awesome. Yeah. So, so when you started that first business, first of all, it was a PR company, right? So, mm -hmm. and no one telling you what to do, where to be, what your priorities are. How did you figure out? Was it overwhelming or was it? It was. I mean, in fact, I had to put, it was the first time I ever really understood having to put rules into my life. Then my ADHD just kicked in. I'm looking out the window. There's a giant, these huge cumulus clouds. It looks like, it looks like a giant hand. Could be a high five. Cool. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, it was the first time I'd ever had to, had to put rules into my own life to allow myself to get by. Um, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd hear my, my neighbors leaving for work. And even though I had clients, I was working in my apartment. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have, uh, I didn't feel like I was employed. I felt like I was homeless. I felt like I was unemployed because I wasn't leaving, right? I wasn't doing anything. And I remember, um, I remember when I, uh, so I had to put these rules into my, into my life. I, I wasn't allowed to, um, like I had to get up, I had to get dressed, right? Mm -hmm. I had to take a shower, I had to get dressed. I had to put on shoes. I had to sit, you know, if I'm in my, and it was in my, de my desk next to my, in my studio apartment, which was right next to my futon, right? right. I had a, but I had to, uh, I remember I, I, I could turn on the TV for, for background noise, but it had to be CNN. It couldn't be like Sale of the Century or, 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 or right. um, you know, a game show or, or I Love Lucy. It had to be like stuff that I'd hear in a newsroom. Right. Um, and these are important rules to me because that was, the, that was how I knew how to get work done. And it turns out as I grew up, as I got older and realized that, you know, I'm diagnosed with ADHD and, and how the ADHD was pretty much responsible for the majority of my success. 
it's those life rules that I started putting into place back in 98 that have morphed into sort of what I am now and the things I do now. Um, my super early rising, you know, my, my, I don't work in a bathrobe. I don't do it. You know, I have to get dressed. It. And it's those things that have really kept me sort of on path um, and prevented me from going down a rabbit hole many, many times, like more times than I can count. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you were going to be an entrepreneur, whether it was then or, or down, down the road. I mean, it was, it seems like it was destined to be, there's probably people on the call who maybe it's not as clear. I mean, how would you advise? How do you, how does one know if one knows at all when the right time is, if there's a right time, if they should follow a passion, if it's too soon, should they start a side hustle? How do you, how do you think about that? There's never, if you keep waiting for the right time, it's never going to happen. I had a trainer once who told me or coach once who told me that, um, if you wait for your body to be ready to go exercise in the morning, you'll never do it. The mind has to explain to the body that it's ready. Mm -hmm. And that's a really, really powerful tool because, you know, you have to stop believing in, I just actually wrote it down because it's a great, this is important. It's a great line. Um, you have to stop looking at where the hell is it hang on um i literally just wrote it down two days ago because i'm like oh i gotta remember that oh you no hang on you have to stop ah it's called beware of destination addiction destination mm -hmm. addiction is the premise that you'll be happy when you get to that next thing you'll be happy when you get that next job you'll be happy when you drop 20 pounds you'll be happy when you find that perfect person you'll be happy when whatever mm-hmm if, you, if you're constantly looking for that next thing to make you happy, you're never going to be happy. Yeah. Happiness comes from doing, mm -hmm. right? If you want to get a much better job, improve yourself and go after it and do it. If you, did, if you want to try entrepreneurship, go try entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Don't rely on something to make you happy. You have to decide, I'm going to be happy and this mm -hmm. is how we get there. Yeah. And that's, that's just a huge thing. Destination addiction. It's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard it said uh, there, there's no there, there, right. People who are looking. Exactly. For yeah. Um, do you think I saw, I saw a prominent CEO entrepreneur post on Twitter, you know, everyone should start a company this year. It should be your goal. And I thought, well, that's a, you know, is everyone really supposed Was to. Was it Vaynerchuk? That sounds no. like some shit Vaynerchuk would say. No, it's the, okay, well, good. Oh, I, no, it wasn't him, but, okay. um, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, I don't necessarily. I don't agree well, with that. Yeah. Okay. Because there's some people, I was dating a woman once and, and, and she calls me one afternoon. She's like, Hey babe, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, I'm hanging out. I'm at the W uh, I'm at the bar at the W it's about 4 PM on a Thursday. I'm at the bar in W I'm, I'm waiting on a, on a client meeting. Oh, the bar at the W to 4 PM on Thursday must be nice. Why don't you do some work? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, bitch, you, A, I'm working much harder than you. B, you don't realize that you're not actually mad at me for having a meeting at the W. You're mad at yourself because you're, you're in a job that doesn't let you do that. Mm -hmm. Right? Don't get angry at me because I decided to take the risk and I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, not everyone should go out and start a company. It's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. People, there are some people who work from nine to five to make money, to enjoy their lives when they're not working. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Who the hell am I or anyone? to be that much of an asshole to begrudge you and say, hey, the way you're living your life is wrong. Mm -hmm. Fuck that. If you're mm -hmm. living your life and you're happy, dude, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, more power to you. Yeah. Don't tell someone they have to start a company, but I will say if you're unhappy and the only reason you're not changing is because you're afraid of what might happen, then I kind of pity you. Yeah. yeah. A great line from the West Wing when Mrs. Lanningham says to, says to Martin Sheen, uh, says to President Bartlett, if you don't want to run for president again because you don't want to run, I respect that. But if you don't want to run because you're afraid you won't win, then hell, Jeb, I don't even want to know you. It's, such yeah. a great line. it's so true, right? If, if, if you don't want to change because you're afraid of what might happen, dude, and you're miserable in your current position, dude. Yeah. Now, I will say that if you want to change and you want to start a company, now happens to be a great time. Whenever there's a crisis, whenever shit hits the fan, that's the best time to make change because so what if you fail, man? Well, look at, look. you can tell me that anything about 2020 was a win, right? Mm -hmm. If you start a business and you fail, 
and you're still alive, you're still ahead of the game right about now. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, the bar yeah. is so goddamn low. So, <laughs> so I don't need you to be awesome. I need you to go out and do it. And if it, if it succeeds, awesome. If it fails, awesome. At least you tried. Yeah. Right. I'd much rather you try than sit there at home and be miserable and say, oh, what if I did right here? What if I didn't? That's the worst thing to have, especially when you're ADHD, man. The worst thing to have is like grass growing under your feet. And man, I wonder what if I did? I mean, shit, I, someone, I bought 10 Bitcoin at a hundred bucks a piece and sold them a thousand bucks a piece and thought I was king of the world. Oh boy. But I'm not going to sit there. I'm not yeah. going to, you know, that'd be over yeah. a quarter million dollars right now. I'm not going to sit there and bitch about it. Whatever it is, what it is. Yeah. Right. I, I, yeah. I, I used the 10 grand I made and, and probably had a blast. I'm sure I did. And I, you know, it was like 10 years ago or something. So yeah. I don't have any issue with failure. I love failure. I've failed a ton. I won't hire someone who hasn't failed. The issue I have is, is that you haven't tried anything, right? That you, that you sit there and you're afraid to try anything. Death by paralysis is a real thing, man. It sucks. You don't want to live your life that way. Let's, and you're so open and transparent. That's one of the things, that's one of the reasons I've been following your story for so long is because you do talk about those things. What are just so, so folks can understand some of the failures that you've gone through um, that you're prepared to talk about? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, back in 2005, I, I created a company where called air introductions, where I thought you could connect. I thought it'd be cool if, cause I was traveling so much. Most of my flights were really crappy. I had one flight where I sat next to Miss Texas. I'm like, well, that was fun. <laughs> the rest of my flight should be like that. So I actually created a website called air introductions to let you choose your seatmate before you get on the flight. Right. And it was pretty cool. It got tons of press, tons of people signed up, but it was too early. Mm-hmm. If I built it today, I would have backed it, back ended it into Expedia, into United.com, into Facebook, and it would have been a piece of cake. Back then, you had to sign up, and you had to enter your flight info, and then you had to look, and it was a pain in the ass, right? I couldn't get critical mass. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I learned from that. I learned that, that, you know, I have no qualms about what I tried. I got a ton of press out of it. It actually, you know, it helped launch my next book. And, you know, I've learned a ton from it, but, you know, I lost probably 50 grand of my own money. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's fine. I mean, eventually it wound up getting acquired by a, by a, by a, 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 a venture firm. Right. And they paid off the majority of my debts. And that was fine. I only lost, you know, a little bit, but it was, it was, I learned a lot from it. I learned a lot about people from it. I remember trying to get funding for it and realizing how many people out there are assholes. Right. And realizing that realizing, I learned two things from air introductions. I learned that if I ever started another company, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take venture. I wouldn't take any sort of funding. And I didn't, when I did Harrow, it was entirely on my own. And when I, when I, when it got acquired, they wrote me the check and that was killer. And second mm-hmm. thing I learned is if I ever did have a lot of money, I wasn't going to be an asshole about it. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to be an asshole with money. I wasn't going to be that guy who sits there and judges everyone's business. Oh, I don't think that's, you know, like, oh, come on, you know, life's too short, man. There are too many assholes out there. Be a decent person. And, and, a lot of what I do now, I probably give away about 99% of my content for free because A, it's the right thing to do. And B, I know that if you like the majority of my content, you're going to buy whatever it is I have when I do have something to sell. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're on my email list. You get, yeah. you get my emails and, 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 and there's so few of them are, are salesy, right? They're very, very rarely sales. They're all like advice or information. Um, every once in a while, I'll, I'll throw a link at the bottom. Hey guys, I'm, I'm running a class on uh, whatever. I'm running a class on how to be a public speaker. Actually, I have a class on, um, on uh, how to, um, it's called Master the Media. And it, it, it comes from everything I learned from three years of running Help a Reporter, right? And mm-hmm. it's like, I'll put it in the, um, I'll put it in the chat here, right? And if people sign up, awesome. If they don't sign up, that's great too. If I'm giving right. you value from this talk, yeah. then that to me is a win, right? Yeah. And if, and so, you know, so it's funny. So, that's, that's the link to the, to, the, to the class. But more importantly, the other link is to my email list. And if you wind up signing up for my email list and not for the class, that's fine. Because if I'm giving you value, I send out those emails maybe once every two weeks, three weeks. It's certainly not a hi, it's Tuesday. Here's your annoying email of the day. Yeah. And so when I send them out, you know, I sent out one yesterday with a link to um, a class I'm building um, about being a public speaker. Mm-hmm. And I think 19 people signed up just from that one line at the bottom said, Hey guys, by the way, I'm doing this thing. Mm-hmm. No hard pitch, no hard sell. I don't, I, I, there are other ways to sell Yeah. without having to be a douche about it. Right. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things I learned really early on is that, is that having an audience, I mean, my email list is about 70,000 strong. Mm-hmm. 
having an audience is a privilege. It's not mm -hmm. a right, man. Mm -hmm. Remember when we, when we did the half Ironman together, I, um, we were both wearing spandex, right? I had to train, I had to train for a year for that race to be, to earn the privilege of wearing spandex. Having an audience is the exact same thing. If I walked down the street right now and wore spandex, I'd get arrested. Some people do not have the right to wear, very few people have the right to wear spandex. But we train for a year. I'm doing Kona in October, right? I'm, gonna, I'm training for a year. I'm going to drop it on 25, 30 pounds. I'll get to the point where I'm, where I'm racing. And at that day, I will have earned the privilege of wearing spandex. <laughs> I'll cross the finish line like 14 hours later. I'm doing my medal. And then some guy comes to me, sir, congratulations. Nice medal. Can you please put on this bulky t-shirt? I get yeah. that. Yeah. Same thing about having an audience. If I don't give my audience the information they want, the way they want it, when they want it, without selling to them, they're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Right? And more, more companies need to learn that. So few yeah. companies understand that. Well, I think what's important for people to understand also is that you built that list over years and the people who get it trust you. Of right? course. They trust you. So they don't really have to know that much. They just know that if Peter's doing it, it's quality. And all I really need to know is one line and a link. And it just, that takes time to build that trust up. That's the thing about Harrow. I mean, Harrow was an email newsletter that before I sold it to PR Newswire, it was going out to 750,000 people three times a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was sending 2.25 million emails a day. Double opt-in. Yeah. Here's the thing. I had a 91% open rate on those emails. That is, I mean, that's, that's obscene. That's crack. Yeah. I, I, I was sending out crack. <laughs> I will never have that again on anything. But the reason for it, because you open that email, you could get in the Wall Street Journal the next day. You could, your business could be the New York Times. You could be featured in People Magazine, whatever. You yeah. had to open them. Yeah. And they weren't bullshit. They weren't like, you know, one query and then four ads. It was just, it was a hundred. It still is. It's still free. They still, you can still sign up for it. It's helpareporter.com. I sold it over 10 years ago, but it's still very much there. Yeah. Um, 150 queries per email, three times a day. You have like 450 chances for free to get in the press mm -hmm. every single day, Monday through Friday. Why wouldn't you open that? Right. Right. And so by keeping it as a text email, clean, simple, to the point, mm -hmm. it became this, this incredible resource for people to use yeah. and it still is. And it, it catapulted my brand into the stratosphere yeah. because three times a day I'm sitting in your inbox and I'm sitting in your inbox with quality content that you need to read. Yeah. But again, it all came from knowing how to respect my audience at the end of the day. Yeah. That's it. You, you have to, that's the only way to live. Did you, um, I mean, how did you learn your, your writing style? Was it something you just developed? I mean, anyone who's ever, I, I noticed a difference. I'm not trying to bash the, the, the buyer of it, but the day you stopped writing email to me, I could tell. Um, so why, where did that come from? Did you train yourself? Is it just something you're naturally gifted at? I've always loved writing. I think that, again, a lot of it comes from ADHD. I write exactly like I talk. Mm -hmm. If you read Faster Than Normal, which is the book I wrote about ADHD, mm -hmm. um, it literally sounds like I'm talking to you, right? It's not a yeah. book that's written like a book. It's written like I'm having a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And I do everything like that. And, and a lot of it's just because that's just what I do. Yeah. Right? Oh, but that's not normal. I don't really care. It works. <laughs> um, right. if, 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 if everything I had to do was normal as, a, as, as considered like what the masses consider normal, I'd be a very boring person. Yeah. Um, I live my life in a way that works for me. And a lot of people seem to like that. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, it's really about knowing what to do. And, and, and again, here's who I am, right? Like this, the song, this is me from, from greatest showman is, is like written for me. Hmm. Right. I don't hmm. care what you think if you, and, and it's not that I don't care what you think. I, mean, I care what my daughter thinks. I care what my parents think. I care what my girlfriend thinks. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I'm not going to waste time worrying about the reactions or, or worrying about what people who don't contribute to my mortgage think of me. Um, okay. I'm going to go out of my way and try to help people because that's what I think we should do. We should help people and we should help animals. We should make the world better than when we leave it than how we found it. Um, other than that, our, our, our goal is just to have fun. Yeah. We're on this planet for a short amount of time, our, our goal is to have fun. Um, I'm at Peter Shankman on all the socials, right? Same name on every single social media platform. And people always tell me when they follow me, they're like, yeah, I follow you because, you know, you might 
occasionally go off on rants, which I did. I, I think I posted like something like 32 tweets yesterday during the impeachment trial. But, but you know, right this morning, I'm back to posting self-deprecating shit about, you know, how Mr. Fatass got up and got on his Peloton for 90 minutes. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. This is who I am and this is me. And, and, and the, the, the key is I write the way I speak, I write the way I think, and I have an audience that finds value in that. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly talking to my audience and asking, are they finding value? And, and how can I give them more value and better value? And what would they like to see, right? Would, yeah. You know, do they want more video? Do they want uh, audio? What, you know, um, my audience, a lot of them are like me. They're not, they like short, short bursts of information, right? The ADHD mm -hmm. brain, like short little bursts of information. Mm -hmm. um, there's this, the, I, I get an, a, a very early access invite to this thing called Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. I was um, gonna this, ask you, yeah. And, and I joined it and I had, I got invited to be on someone else's chat. I had to sit there for a freaking hour, <laughs> unable to do anything else. <laughs> like, wow, this is just incredibly not for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I can't sit anywhere for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, this, this conversation right now is about as long as we'll go. I can't go, you know, I have people, well, we'd like you to speak for two hours. I'm like, great. Over several weeks. How would you like that? You know? <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, you know, where your audience is, you know, it works. I know that as I'm walking down the street, um, uh, going to pick up my daughter later, maybe I'll do a Facebook live because mm. I can do it from my hand as I'm walking the street and that kills two birds with one stone. Yeah. I get the dope meat of the walk. I get the conversation with my audience. Everyone wins. Yeah. yeah. It's the same reason I hate talking on the phone. Yeah. Right. If I have talking on the phone, I have to actually pay attention to talking on the phone. I hate that. Right. Well, I, I can say, so when you and I did our, did our pre-interview call, we chatted for a few minutes. Um, I went back and I was looking through your Twitter feed just to, you know, kind of see what you're working on. And I noticed you probably shot off four tweets during our conversation. Um, but I would never know the difference because you're that, I mean, you like a lot of things going on. I mean, it's, yep. it's, it's what you do. And, and I know that about you. And so I, I just found that interesting. It was just a, a real life example in the moment. Well, and that's, I mean, that's the key though. You know, it, it doesn't mean I'm not focused on you. Right. Right. Right, right on, now, when yeah. we're talking, I know that you have what a hundred people in the audience. It is my job to be very focused on them. And so I am focused on you. My laptop is closed. I mean, it's, it's open, but I, I have zoom is, is full screen. I'm not looking yeah. at my email. I'm not checking my my texts, you know, everything's on silent um, because that's a respect that, that you and your audience deserve. Right, right. Um, but I think that the, the problem is, is that we live in this multitasking world where people think it's totally okay in the middle of a conversation to open up your email and start reading it. It's really not, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you only, you know, it's the same before the air killed us by going outside um, I used to take all my meetings. I used to have walking meetings, which is if you want to meet with me, we can do it one of five ways. We can meet at 5 a.m. for a run or a bike in the park, after which I'll buy you a cup of coffee and we'll talk. Uh, we can take a Peloton class at 6 a.m. in the studio. Um, uh, if, in the, after which, you know, we'll have a cup of coffee. You can meet me at Peloton or, or you meet me at my apartment at 7 a.m. after my workouts and we'll walk to my office together. Right. But what I will not do is have a 10 a.m. or 10 30 a.m. coffee with you in Midtown mm -hmm. because I'm then leaving my, I have to leave my office at 9 30 to get 9 45 to get there, which means I have to shut down at 9 15, which means mm -hmm. that I get the, I get the meeting. I have this half an hour with you and I have to walk out it. I've just killed three hours of my day right. for what may be a 15 minute. No. So we will meet on my terms. Um, and like I said, it'll probably be a 20 minute meeting at most. Right. That's very Darwinistic right there. If I tell you that we can meet at 5 a.m., because everyone, I get a lot of people, can you pick my brain? I always say yes. You're welcome to pick my brain at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Meet me in Central Park. Mm -hmm. Or 7 a.m., meet me outside my apartment, we'll walk to my office. Mm -hmm. um, the Darwinism comes in the fact that if they don't, if that's too early for them, mm -hmm. or that's not worth getting up for, well, that tells me everything I need to know about them, and chances are I don't want to meet with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, let's, uh, so let's talk about the ADHD. It's something that you obviously embrace. You started a podcast. It's a, I, I've listened to it. I've got a lot of value out of it. You have amazing guests on it. Um, you, I, unless I, I, I think I remember from your book that you didn't find out technically that you had ADHD until later in life. Although you looking back, you probably thought it was obvious looking back, but tell us about your journey. And I know you don't like to use the word when you're diagnosed, but found out that you had the gift of ADHD. Just talk a little bit about that. So all my life, I was a weirdo, right? I grew up weird. Um, uh, you know, when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s in high school, the 80s in New York City, uh, I went to high school performing arts, right? The famous school. Uh, I could sing. And um, I had no problem with the class I was great at. It's the, the stuff that I loved. The stuff I was terrible at, I was failing out left and right. And <clears throat> ADHD wasn't a thing. What was a thing was sit down and you're disrupting the class. Mm -hmm. The irony is that why was I disrupting the class? I was, I was a class clown. I was making jokes. Why? Because those jokes would give my brain dopamine. Mm -hmm. And the dopamine would actually allow me to focus and learn. I, when you're ADHD, you don't get the same amount of dopamine as normal people. And so you're constantly looking around for something exciting mm -hmm. to give you that energy. Mm -hmm. And so I'd get in trouble. My parents could never understand why I couldn't just shut up and keep quiet in class. I never understood it. And it wasn't until my mid thirties, I've seen a therapist. And he's like, so, you know, Peter, I mean to ask you, you know, have you ever, have you seen the new line of ADHD drugs? What, what, what medication are you currently taking for your ADHD? Like, what are you talking about? I don't have ADHD. He's like, uh, yeah, 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 you do. <laughs> and um, that was the first time I'd ever, ever had any sort of concept of that. And as soon as I went and took the test and got diagnosed, I went, aha, I literally I come to America, taste the soup, right? Everything made sense, right? This explains everything. This explains my relationship my, or inabilities to have them. This explains why I can take the garbage to the front door and then it'll sit at the front door for five days instead of bringing it outside. All this shit all of a sudden made sense. And so, um, you know, why can I start companies on a dime but can't, you know, can't commit to a dinner yeah. Everything started to make sense. And that's when I realized, well, shit, all the stuff I've been doing to keep me functioning is actually our hacks, our, 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 our brain hacks, our ways to improve myself. I just have to figure them all out. Hang on. Echo, living room thermostat to off. God, that's awesome. um, and that's one of the things that I learned is as I started ca cataloging these hacks and realizing what they were and what they were doing for me, everything became crystal clear, right? And but both the good and the bad, right? Mm -hmm. I started realizing um, you know, I don't I can go months without drinking. But when I sit down for a drink, I don't have one drink, I have eight. Right. Not because I'm trying to get drunk, but because it's in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to my therapist once. I'm like, dude, does this mean I'm an alcoholic? He goes, well, yeah, probably. But he goes, you're not <laughs> an alcoholic in the sense that, you know, you need to drink at 6 a.m. He goes, do you, he says, what is, what does tequila have in common with pizza? I'm like, what? He's like, you eat and drink them at the same speed. He goes, have you ever noticed you've never had leftover pizza in your life? I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm like, well, that's not really a thing. He's like, no, for most people, leftover pizza is a thing. <laughs> like, like, well, shit, I didn't know that. You know, I just thought you ordered the pizza, it arrived, you ate the pizza. Right? And that's, so, you know, you put those rules into play. If my daughter wants pizza, we don't order in a pie because she'll have a slice and a half and I'll have five and a half or six and a half. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go to the pizza place mm -hmm. and we'll buy two slices or three slices and we'll bring them home and she'll have two and I'll have one. And that's how I make sure that I don't eat a whole pizza. And it's the same thing with alcohol. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't have the ability to moderate. I have, I have two speeds and they are namaste and I'll cut a bitch. And there's absolutely no middle ground in there. And so understanding that about myself allows me to focus on living my life in a way that prevents me from going off the rails. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, I don't keep alcohol in the house. Um, okay. I very rarely drink. 
Uh, more than likely or not, it's because I'm training for something, but that's just a great, ex- it's a great excuse, but it's still an excuse. Right. I don't drink because I understand <clears throat> that, you know, am I going to have, am I going to get drunk and go and pillage a village somewhere and wind up jumping? No, of course not. But what's going to happen is I'll have several drinks. I'll come home. I'll fall asleep. The sleep won't be good. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm a big guy. I already have a, I already have sleep apnea. So the sleep won't be good. I probably will forget to wear my mask. So the sleep won't be good. I'll wake up. I'll feel like shit. Well, I didn't wake up at 4 a.m. to work out. So it's obviously not going to be a great day. So uh, that being said, you know, screw it. Let's go order two bacon, egg and cheese sandwiches for breakfast. That'll soak up some of the alcohol. Well, screw it. If I did that, I might as well order a pizza. Now it's like three months later, I've been in that cycle. I'm 20 pounds heavier and I hate everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's the line from war games? The only winning move is not to play. Let's just mm-hmm. not play. Well, there's already one person. I'm sure there are others who are just uh, not asking, but how do you find out? How do you find you, out? Yeah. If so you, definitely, I mean, my I, look, I, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not sitting here pitching my book, but I, I do talk about it a lot in the book because again, I didn't know I had it. The book is called Faster Than Normal. Um, you can find it on Amazon anywhere you want, fasterthannormal.com even. And the, um, you want to talk to someone. You want to talk to a therapist. I mean, there are tons of, of, of tests online, but they're mostly kind of bullshit. Um, if you can, you know, now, now with like Talkspace and all the different sites that are out there where you can, uh, where you can um, connect with a therapist, just talk to one. Mm-hmm. You know, it's pretty obvious. To, if you think you have it, you probably do, but you want to get tested just to know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for me, I mean, I just, again, didn't know really what it was. And then as soon as he started knocking these things, I'm reading this book. I'm like, well, you know, if you have 20, 20 or more of these hundred questions, right. Chances are you have it. I had like 97, right. I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, there you go. You yeah. know? And again, it's just, it's just sort of one of those things where it's not, having ADHD is not, nothing will be the end all be all of your existence. It's not knowing you have ADHD or taking meds for it is not going to radically change anything until you're ready to change. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the key, you know, nothing can make you change until you're ready to change, whether that's drinking, drugs, food, sex, whatever, until you're ready to say, okay, you know what? I'm done with this shit, or I want to make it better, or I want to improve. That's when it'll happen. Um, And that's really what I learned you know, I remember I had a girlfriend once uh, who I said to her, I said, you know, it's funny. Whenever I drink, I just, I feel like I drink too much. I wonder if I have a problem with alcohol. Oh, don't be stupid. You don't have a problem with alcohol. If you want to drink, drink less, just drink less. Oh, well, it's that simple. <laughs> Fuck me, right? You know, right. I'm sitting there, what the hell? You know, she, she wasn't, she wasn't wrong per se. I mean, she could have been a little less of a bitch about it, but she wasn't wrong per se. The issue was that she doesn't have the same brain as I do. Right. So only I can understand right. if I'm like that. And, and. You know, the cool thing about it, I mean, there's so many great things about having ADHD or having a a neurodiverse brain. You know, I started helping report her out because I had an idea in an airport uh, security line in LAX. By the time I landed in Houston, I had a sketch of the company. I went to the lounge. I had a soda, called a guy I knew who knew how to program websites. Like, can you build me something like a one pager that captures people's emails? And he's like, sure. By the time I landed in New York, I had help a reporter done. Wow. Right? The flip side of that is that same um, speed at which I come up with ideas for companies is the same speed at which I say, well, oh, a $500 hand table is open up a black. Okay. I'll play a couple, you mm-hmm. know? And, mm-hmm. and, and, and so that's led me to, I just, I actually just tweeted that. I, I tweeted, you know, one time I had a spur of the moment feeling and I put $500 down the hand and I split eights and I had, I lost cause he had 21 and I pulled 18s and I lost a thousand dollars. That was a spur of the moment feeling. Storming the Capitol is not a spur of the moment idea, but anyway. And so, you know, but my point is, is that understanding that that's how my brain works, my speaking kind of, I speak all around the world. Before, before COVID, I was traveling mm-hmm. 300,000 miles a year for speeches. Mm-hmm. Now I do them all from this chair. But when I was doing that, my, my speaking uh, contract said, here's my fee. Here's my travel expenses. You will pay me. I will show up at this date and time and speak. And I'll go home. Except when it was a speech in Las Vegas. It was a speech in Las Vegas. It said, you will fly me into, uh, if it's a morning keynote or an evening keynote, you will fly me into Los Angeles the morning of or the day before. Um, no, no, if it's, if it's a morning keynote, you'll fly me to LA the night before. Mm-hmm. And then I will take a 6 a.m. flight to Vegas and be there for your 9 a.m. keynote. If it's an evening speech, I will come in in the afternoon, speak in the evening, and you'll fly me to LA for the night before I fly home to New York the next morning. Um, 
The only time that one applies, if it's a lunchtime keynote, I'll take a 6 a.m. flight out, land, do the speech, take a 4 p.m. flight home. Mm -hmm. The reason for that being is because if it's a morning or an evening keynote in Vegas to fly from New York, I'd have to spend a night on either side, you know, either, either in the morning or the night before the night after there. Mm -hmm. Am I going to like dive into my kid's college fund and, and, and lose it? Of course not. But let's not put that opportunity on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just take that out of the equation yeah. and people say, Oh, what, if, you know, what if no one wants to agree to that and you lose your keynote, then it wasn't meant to be. Right. You know, like I said, am I going to get drunk and do it? Probably not, but yeah. why risk that? Yeah. You know, am I going to, am I going to, if I, if I, if I drive somewhere one day without a seatbelt, am I going to get killed? Probably not, but let's not take that chance if we don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you talk about a lot of these rules. What, what are some of the technologies? I know you're obviously, you know, you use technology constantly in your life. What are some of the technology hacks that you put in place you know, to, to keep focused on task? So everything in my life is, um, is automated as much as humanly possible. My lights in my apartment start coming on, in my bedroom start coming on at 3.30 in the morning. Um, by 3.45, uh, 10 to 4, they're pretty much at full, full power. Um, at four o'clock, my alarm goes off on the off chance that I am not up already. And I am already asleep. I've already slept in my, in my bike shorts and a pair of socks. Uh, I roll five inches to my left and I'm on my bike, right? I'm on my Peloton. Uh, my Peloton name is also Peter Shankman. Again, feel free to add me. I'd love to race. I'm, I'm doing a 90 minute ride at 4 a.m. tomorrow Eastern. Peter, so, I, I, I looked you up on Peloton. You, you're actually a little, a little too aggressive, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, well, but think yeah. about that. A 90-minute ride tomorrow at 4 a.m. means by 5.30, I will have all the dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline I need for the day. I won't have to take medication. That's huge. Yeah. 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 Do, you, um, do you believe in work-life balance? I mean, is it something? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. I, when I go to sleep, I shut my phone off. Not, and not, not just silent. I shut it off. Yeah. Because if I woke, if I had to wake up at two in the morning to go to the bathroom and I look at my phone, you know I'm gonna be up like an hour. But if I have to wait a minute and a half for it to boot up, I'm not gonna do that. So let's go right into bed. Yeah. I, I take time off. I go off the grid. No, no question. You have to have it. I don't work. I don't. It was a great cartoon I used to keep for the New Yorker that said, "I'm not a workaholic. I just work to relax." But I might go on a plane and fly 14 hours to Tokyo and give a speech, and then take three days to go skydiving in Thailand. Um, I found that balance. Yeah, you gotta have it, man. You can't just do yeah. one or the other. And and the 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 quote unquote entrepreneurial dudes out there you know who are screaming and, and shouting out and uh, oh you know man you gotta if you, if you have a full-time job you should have a side hustle for eight hours and then if you only have three hours of sleep that's fine you don't need sleep are telling you to kill yourselves and that's real but it's some bullshit man don't do that yeah. live a positive life yeah get some sleep get enough sleep get eight hours of sleep a night exercise eat a goddamn vegetable every once in a while pizza's not a vegetable <laughs> right take care of yourselves yeah and i know i i know you gotta stop here i, I have about two minutes more and i gotta go pick up my kid yes okay so if anybody's got a question, I've got hundreds of questions I could ask. <laughs> if anyone if any does, you're welcome to email me. Peter at Shankman.com is my email. Uh, if you just click on the link, shank.mn slash emails, you'll sign up for my list as well. Um, at, like I said, at Peter Shankman on all the socials. I, I do answer my own email. I'm not allowed to schedule things. My assistant took right access to my calendar away from me about 10 years ago after I booked two different dinners, two <laughs> dinners on the same exact night on different continents. She was a little angry about that, but um, I am allowed to answer my email and I do that. So I will always yeah. answer any questions. No, you definitely do. And when I asked you to be on this, you responded maybe in 30 seconds. So <laughs> um, I, I, let me ask you this. So what, what's either, you, you can answer either way. What's the best piece of advice you've been given for your career? Or if you haven't been given any great advice, what, what advice would you give somebody who's early on in their career? Best advice I've been given is very simple. If you don't like where you are moved, you're not a tree. Um, yeah. If you're unhappy, change something, right? Uh, if you can change it, don't worry about it. If you can't yeah. change it, nothing you can do. Don't worry about it. Either yeah. way, don't worry about it. Life is too short. <laughs> Life is way yeah. too short. And the other, the other piece of advice I got, uh, <clears throat> um, if you can't change the people around you, change the people around you. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, that was like, my, that was, my mind was blown on that. Life's yeah. too short to spend with people that don't understand you. Too short. Yeah, definitely. I'm just curious, besides your own, what podcasts, are there podcasts that you like and listen to? 
Uh, yeah. So what do I love? I love, like I said, Fast and Normal's mine. Obviously, that's the best one in the world. Um, <laughs> what else do I love? Let me see. I love, um, I have my list here. It's funny. Most of them I listen to on planes as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably behind all of them. Um, I listen to, um, strangely enough, there's a, I, don't, I, I don't play golf. I, the sport, I, it kills me. There's nothing about golf that I like. But there's a, there's a, um, a podcast called Driving Improvement. Uh, with a guy named Mark Russo, who's with the PGA. Hmm. And it is a golf podcast. It's not really about golf. Hmm. I've learned a lot of valuable lessons from there. I totally recommend that. Um, I like, um, uh, I don't recommend it with Deborah Dean. Um, there's one called Generation Slay, which is by a, a girl named Emma Haverho. She's uh, like 23. I, I keep a stable of kids uh that sounds really wrong um, <laughs> wow i have a collection of that sounds even worse i there's about 10 kids age 14 to 23 that every three months well we used to before covid every three months we meet for pizza and i would um buy them pizza and just watch what they did right that's how i learned about snapchat before anyone else and got my own got my got peter shankman on snapchat that's how i learned mm-hmm. about uh, twi- uh, uh, uh tiktok and all these things i i Every, every three months, I'd sit with these kids and just watch them for 90 minutes and watch what, what apps they're using. What, that's how I found out about Fortnite and about Among Us and all these things. Um, so I strongly encourage you, have people outside of your own circle. Yeah. Um, they, will, they will help you. Um, what else do I love? Um, fun podcast called Everything is Terrible. Um, the Clip Out is a Peloton-based podcast that I've, I've been oh. on several times. And then, of course, uh, Petapixel, which is about photography, and the West Wing Weekly, which is just awesome. Very eclectic. Yeah, random. I like it. Yeah. All right. Well, like I said, I could I could pepper you with questions all day. I, I really appreciate you doing this. It's a bit of thrill for me and uh, someone that I've followed and looked up to in the marketing world and entrepreneurship world for a long time. So well, Keith, as really you know, you saved my life at our Iron Man. So of course I have no <laughs> choice but do your bidding. And I know, but I appreciate I appreciate you you having me on, man. I'm happy to come back anytime. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we're gonna cut it there. Uh, if you have any questions, Peter is very accessible. Peter, one more time, your email. Yeah, it's peter at shankman.com. And I'm at Peter Shankman on all the socials. Perfect. And you can do us one favor. If you, if you like these webinars, just tell a friend about them. Hopefully they can join too next time. All right. For, for Peter, thank you so much. Appreciate it. My pleasure. All right.